terms of rehearsal planning, again, it comes in with that symphonic context, having a really specific idea of what I want. But beyond that, I would say with the orchestra, it's not that different what I would do in the moment. The only difference is that in an operatic context, I may give the orchestra more background information. Hi there! Welcome back to another episode of the Conductors Podcast. I'm your host Chao Wenting, and I'm thrilled to have you here because my guest today is a very, very special person. Okay, okay. I know I say that to almost every single guest here on my podcast, but you know, I just want the best for you, right? And my guest that I'm speaking with today, I met her. At the Dallas Opera Heart Institute for Women Conductors, and you probably noticed that a lot of my friends and my networking comes from that particular institute. She, however, did not go the same year when I was a fellow. She was the first year cohort fellow, so she went the year before me. But we used to have this reunion and gathering, so you can network and meet people before or after you. So that's how we met. We met at one of the reunions that was hosted by the Dallas Opera, and I have shared this openly before, but I just want to tell you again if you missed it. I did not get into that program the first time I applied. I wasn't even shortlisted for the first year, but then I worked again the second year, sending my materials, and I also like between the first time I applied and the second time I went out. And did a lot more other programs, kind of broadened my networks. So the second time that I applied, actually someone had vouched for me directly to the administration at the Dallas Opera. So that was one thing that was really special about that experience. And I'm saying that just to encourage anyone and everyone: if you don't get something the first time, it's okay. Just try again next time. Sometimes the universe is not ready for you yet, or sometimes, like there is this one particular program that I have applied for three or four times now already. But throughout the course, they have changed their focus, and I was at the point of feeling, okay, this is not something that I want to do anymore because the direction they are going right now doesn't really align with my mission or my core value. I'm not saying they are not doing great things. Just they have a different focus now, and I don't regret sending in my materials because I've got to know the person handling application. Every time she would say, "Hey, it's so great that you're applying again," and I always have this little voice in my mind that, "Yeah, I'm applying again, and I never got it. That's why I'm applying again." <laughs> But I just want to say this to encourage anyone and everyone that's listening. This is so common that we feel rejected, or sometimes even like a failure that we have to apply for things. For so many times, I still don't get in. But just don't take it personal. Don't think that you're not getting it because you're not good. Sometimes it's just they are looking for a different type of people to work with, and it's nothing against you as a musician and as a person. All right. With that all said, my guest today, Lydia Yankovskaya, will be talking to us about her career. Conducting in both the opera houses and working with symphonic orchestras, she had a lot of great things to share. How she prepares them differently, how the rehearsal process, and how she navigates the different scheduling challenges. And it's such a great, wonderful conversation. I can't wait for you to hear it. So let's dive in. Hey, Lilia! Thank you so much for coming to the Conductors Podcast. I'm so excited to speak with you. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, before we get started, I always do ask this question to all my guests. Can you tell us a little bit about your background, how you started, and how you get to where you are right now? Yes. So I started conducting very early. I was still a high school student.、Uh, my background is as a pianist, then a violinist, then a singer. I studied violin and piano, sang in choirs my entire life, accompanied choirs also as a pianist. And when I was in high school,、uh, I won this concerto competition as a pianist with my youth orchestra, in which I normally played violin. 
And the orchestra conductor encouraged me to lead rehearsals from the piano because it was a Mozart concerto. And he said, well, during Mozart's time, this would have been led from the piano. And that seemed to come naturally to me and it just felt right. And so he recognized this and gave me an opportunity at our next performance to conduct a piece. It was a movement of Dvorak's Seventh Symphony. I had no idea what I was doing, but not only gave me the opportunity to conduct, but gave me the resources to learn how to do it properly. Spent time one-on-one with me, teaching me how to conduct another teacher also at my high school. Spent time with me, teaching me kind of basic technique. He gave me extra time with the players, with my colleagues, and extra sectionals and extra time so that I could not just practice, but also really learn how to do it properly and really understand what it meant to conduct. And I was bitten by the conducting bug. I didn't realize that it's a viable profession or one could even really pursue this. But when I was in college, I I studied piano and voice. I kept playing violin for a little while and I kept conducting and it became clear that it was just the right path for me. This is really exciting. And I hear this story a lot, like my colleagues got just discovered or supported by a mentor at a young age. And it's such an important thing. So I wanted to congratulate you on completing the first post-pandemic, if we are allowed to be post-pandemic yet, like the first season. How was it? How was the season coming back, like recovering from pandemic for you? Well, I've been very fortunate because I'm the music director at Chicago Opera Theater, and Chicago Opera Theater has been the perfect sized organization to not just survive the pandemic, but in a way to thrive through it. Because we're big enough to weather the storm, but also small enough to be flexible. It's a $3 million organization, plus or minus. And that has been a really, in some ways, it's been a wonderful opportunity to kind of sit back and rethink and reimagine and reexamine. During the pandemic, I had the opportunity to create this really successful conversation series digitally that we had, but we also uh, recorded many, many projects. We explored new work. We, of course, like everybody else, had to pivot that awful word that we've been using nonstop for two years. But we continued to present as much or actually more work than we had ever before. And some of my pandemic projects, of course, like everybody else, had many cancellations, but some of them uh, still happened. Others got moved. And uh, like so many people right now, I'm in this crazy flurry of uh, my schedule has kind of exploded because I still have the things that were scheduled pre-pandemic. Then I have all of the reschedules from the pandemic times adding on to that. And of course, none of us are used to that crazy nonstop go, go, go all the time anymore. So it's been a lot of careful planning as we rev back up. And luckily this spring, I had already planned to free up my schedule somewhat. So it's made it a slightly more gradual return to to nonstop work. But I am so thrilled to be back at it. Actually, just a week ago, I had a concert at Omaha Symphony, which was all big French rep. We did Daphne and Chloe and Debussy's Image and all of this big rep. And it was so amazing to just be back in front of a giant orchestra with all the winds and all the strings and just everybody and a full audience for a second performance. And that's really something that I missed a lot. So it's great to be back. Yes, it's such a great thing having the full ensemble without the plastic shields or or distancing. It it may get so hard to hear and to listen to each other and rehearse. But since you say that scheduling had been crazy or is going to be, but I'm just imagining like since you do opera and then they are much longer cycles you're going for weeks or sometimes months and how do you juggle the work demands from symphonic concerts like in addition to your busy opera schedule yeah well and i do kind of half and half and in some ways that's harder to do one or the other i found because if you do operas you can just schedule your few month long commitments over the course of the year and in between you're free. Or if you do symphonic commitments, they're all shorter. It's usually about four or five days that you leave. And again, your weeks in between are free. But what's tricky is that I have these long opera stretches and then in between I have the symphonic ones and then back to opera. I would say that it's a lot of very careful planning and very careful scheduling, especially in terms of learning repertoire, because in opera productions in particular, it's very difficult to carve out time to study 
unless you're in that last performance period, because you're working six days a week. I mean, it's at least six hours a day, six days a week, but it always ends up being more. You have to be careful about kind of planning really far out in particular for the symphonic projects, but for everything, I'm now very conscious of starting the study process way, way in advance to make sure that I get everything in in time. You actually just answered a little bit of my next question about score study, because that's a huge part of our profession that people don't see. <laughs> like a lot of people think about us waving our arms, but as you say, like opera, when it's a much bigger work, you have to devote so much more time, especially with the language, if it's a, lang- a different language, a new language, a new production, since you do so much new opera. And How do you really juggle all those parts with the symphonic and opera? Like, how do you manage your time? Yeah, well, the language thing, certainly, especially if it's actually next year, I'm conducting two operas in Polish. So I'm learning Polish right now. And I started a couple of months ago and I just took away a little at a time. You know, a few 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, I try to get something in. And then as we get closer, I have a kind of time in the summer where I'll be freer, where my plan is to sit down and really, really study. But I think a lot of it is, again, just very careful advanced planning. I have, um, I kind of create a rough calendar for myself of what I have to learn over the next six months or so, or maybe even a year. And what are the pockets of time when I have to focus on all of those things? I'm also very careful about carving out score studies time and putting it into my schedule. So I will block off parts of my schedule when I'll say avoid scheduling unless necessary during these blocks. And that will be basically my score study blocks. I'm also, it depends, different people study differently, but for me, I need to just be in my own space for at least a stretch of three or more hours where nobody is bothering me. There are some people who prefer to study in shorter stretches or shorter spurts. I need those blocks of time that are just dedicated to that study. So I also find that there are specific times of day that work better for me. I'm definitely a night owl. So for me, it's between 8 p.m. and whenever I'm done. I know. (laughs) Exactly. So 8 to midnight, for instance, that's like four hours that I can carve out. Usually nobody's bothering me because most other people are either asleep or doing something fun at that time. So from 8, not to say the score study isn't fun because I enjoy it, but 8 to midnight, I can sit down and I can just focus on the scores. But sometimes that's in the middle of the day too. But I do, I have a kind of a plan that's sketched out where I will say, these are the things I have to get done or focus on this week. These are the things I have to get done over the course of this month. And these are the things I have to get done by the end of the summer. And I have a running list of just on my computer and like a a little sticky note of here are my upcoming shows on the repertoire I need to know for them. Because especially when you get into a lot of symphonic concerts and actually with the symphonic repertoire, that's harder. With operas, I just know I have to learn this opera and then this opera. But with the symphonic concerts, it's so much rep and it's a lot to keep track of. And it's easy to just kind of forget that you have to know this other thing three months from now, but that you won't have time in between to study it. I'm so happy that you're the first night owl that I interviewed. Like every amount of people that I spoke with, they were like, oh, I'm up by four to study. I was like, I sometimes only get to bed by four. <laughs> but I'm so happy that there's an added night owl. But we know this is such a process and you have everybody has their own way and you develop and you change as you become more mature and more experienced. But do you prepare the symphonic repertoire differently from you? I mean, other than the language side from the opera. Yes, to some extent, yes, because in opera, and you mentioned the language side, but besides learning the languages and the translation, those things aside, in opera, everything comes from the language and from the story in a way that it doesn't in symphonic repertoire. And there's some programmatic, of course, programmatic symphonic works, but it's even then it's different. So in opera, I start with the story and I start with the libretto and before I even think about the music, because that's what the composer started with. The composer started with the story and then bringing that story to life. And in opera, every musical decision that I make, phrasing decision or even sound color or whatever it might be, 
comes from that storytelling aspect. So I'll be thinking, what is this character trying to say at this moment? And how can the orchestral color or the tempo or the harmonic structure that's written in or anything, phrasing, how does all of that serve the story in this moment? And also in opera, I think a lot about various options for any given moment, because so much of it depends on, uh, sometimes I'll get into the room and I might not have worked with the singers before. And the voice may be totally different from what I expected to be cast for this role. Right. And that might totally change my interpretation just because of what that singer can do or what they do well, or what their voice is focused on, but also the production aspect. I may get into the room and the stage director may see the piece in a totally different way than I expected. So with opera, I spend a lot more time trying to come up with different options and thinking about, okay, if we tell this story like this, and if this is the nature of the character, then this scene will be played very differently and performed very differently than if we tell this story in this other way. All of that affects the musical aspects, both in terms of, again, voices and storytelling. With symphonic repertoire, you know what symphonic instruments will sound like more or less. And of course, yes, each orchestra has their own sound. Each orchestra has their own quality or style of playing. So there are some variations and certain orchestras excel or focus on certain kinds of playing than others, but it's much more clear cut. And with symphonic repertoire, I focus much more on coming in with a very specific interpretation of what I want and what I hope to achieve. Yes, some of that might adjust because maybe I want a very, let's say, historically informed interpretation of this Mozart, and then I come in and the orchestra approaches it from a totally different way, and there's just not enough time to completely rethink it. So I have to adjust. But In general, I would say that's the big difference. In opera, the focus is on what are the 10 ways that this can be performed and what are the implications of each one and how does it change in storytelling? And in a symphonic context, what is the color and the phrase and the shape that I want for this piece? And what is my idea of it? And how can I make that idea as clear as possible right from the very get-go? Yes, and you mentioned that the rehearsal is very different, and with symphonic orchestras, it's usually much shorter. You have two to four rehearsals, if you're lucky, <laughs> with American orchestras. So do you going, like I should say, do you going with different mindsets of, okay, one is being more flexible, while the other, you have very clear ideas. Do you plan the rehearsal also differently, and does that influence how you prepare your scores? Well, and that's an interesting thing you bring up because yes, on, so in opera, you have a much longer rehearsal period, but most of that is with the singers and just the p- singers and the pianist and the director in a room. So you have that time to really form the dramatic interpretation usually before you get to the orchestra. But I should say that sometimes that's different too. And there are times in opera where you have a shorter process and it's the same thing. Then it becomes like symphonic conducting where you come with a really particular view and you just do it. But the orchestral time with opera is much shorter. And this is tricky, especially since the shows tend to be much longer. You might have a three, four hours sometimes opera. You don't even have time to get through the whole thing in the rehearsals that you have. So I have to plan rehearsals very carefully in a different way. Sometimes I have to think about maybe I don't need to get to certain sections. Maybe they'll be fine even if they're basically sight read at the dress rehearsal, but I do have to get to these other things. So I plan very carefully. In a symphonic context, usually the program is shorter and you'll have, let's say, four rehearsals for an hour and 15 minutes of music as opposed to often it's just two orchestra reads in an opera for the four or more hours of music. You have dress rehearsals, but it's not the same kind of rehearsal time. There's a lot more to worry about. So I would say in terms of rehearsal planning, again, it comes in with that symphonic context, having a really specific idea of what I want. But beyond that, I would say with the orchestra, it's not that different. What I would do in the moment, the only difference is that in an operatic context, I may give the orchestra more background information. So I might say, like, at this moment, timpanist, you're not just playing, you are representing thunder, right? Because that will affect how the timpanists play. In an orchestral setting, even if I want that kind of color in a symphony, I'm probably not going to say, can you play that as if that's thunder? No, I might say, like, use a different kind of stick and can that be, I have a different kind of resonance or whatever it might be. But in an operatic context, because it serves the story, 
I might tie it to the story more precisely and also point out what the connection to the singers is. I'll often sing through the entire opera, actually through those opera rehearsals and sing all the roles. Even if I sing them badly, it gives people a better sense of kind of, oh, that's what's happening. And sometimes as I sing, I'll translate things on the fly if I think it's important for them to know that at this moment, not only does the singer sing this note, but they sing the word death. And they may or may not speak whatever language the opera is in. So I might translate as I sing it along. Uh, So that's also a little bit different. This is amazing that you just shared. So do you prepare operatic repertoire to an extent that you can sing through the entire opera? So you learned each line. And I was curious because I am so glad that you brought up that you're learning Polish. So when you are studying or like learning Polish, do you start with a libretto, like with a goal of learning those words? Or you start with it, like really learning the language, knowing more about the language in general? And do you use IPA to support or just try to speak as fluent as a native speaker? Good question. So uh, I, and not everybody sees it this way, I feel strongly that I need to have at least the basic knowledge of the language in order to conduct in that language. Because so much of any words set to music, it's not just about pronunciation and understanding what it means. It's understanding the flow of the language and the quality of the language because that affects the music making. So I feel strongly that I have to have spent some time studying the language and understanding the language outside of the libretto in order to conduct it in. And I don't usually take, I don't, I've never conducted something in a language that I haven't studied. I always make sure that there are languages that I speak at least to some extent. So for instance, having to to do Polish coming up. I do speak Russian, which helps a lot with Polish and German as well, but both of those and uh, some Czech and all of those are kind of related to Polish, but it's a different language, (laughs) a very distinct language. So I'm studying it on my own for many months. I'm doing like some tutoring in it. Then obviously sitting down with the libretto, digging in and making sure I know the language of the text of the opera itself extremely well. And then I usually spend time with a language coach who's a native speaker also working through that text. Because even if it's a language I speak well, for instance, French, I studied from age, I don't know, 10 and through college and studied abroad in France and worked there for a while. But even then, I'm not a native speaker. And uh, for instance, I was doing some Carmen's this fall. So I sat down with a diction coach who's also a native speaker, who's really good and went through the text because there are always little things, not just pronunciation wise that uh, apply to the music, but also in terms of little meanings of words that you might not grasp unless you have that cultural context or you're a native speaker. And that's very important. And it's important to how you interpret the music. Yeah, definitely. I found sometimes it's just like a nuances of the word choice, like a native speaker coach would let you know oh if because it's this word not the other word so so it has this implication and that's really fascinating so i wanted to ask so like you talk about repertoire and do you usually have a choice when you go into guest conduct with opera houses or symphonic orchestra can you say okay now i'm doing the french you did you just did this french repertoire with omaha can you take that repertoire to another guest conducting gig so you don't have to learn it so much That's a good question. It really depends so much on the orchestra. Sometimes there's sometimes where you just get handed repertoire and you're told, here's the program we're doing. And are you willing to do this program? So then that becomes the conversation. And in those cases, either, yeah, I love this program and I want to do it, or I love most of this program, but I'm not sure about this one piece. And maybe can we switch it out for something else? And it depends also what kind of orchestra you're working with and how open they are. Some organizations are much more open than others in those terms. Sometimes you might turn something down because it's just not quite the right thing for you. And that's, I think, the hardest thing to do as a conductor, to be aware of this is a great opportunity. This may be a great organization, but I don't know that I want to do this piece or to do it this way, or I don't think this particular group is the best fit for this piece in terms of how I want to do it. There are some organizations where they'll ask you for the program or you can propose it. I know sometimes my management will reach out to specific organizations and say, like Lydia is interested in conducting this piece and this piece and this piece. Are you looking at any of those? So it's a balancing act and it depends on how badly do I want to work there and what kinds of projects am I most interested in collaborating with this 
particular organization on because certain organizations also have certain things that they excel at the most. And I love that you brought up the topic of sometimes you have to say no to a certain invitation. And I don't know, can you speak a little bit about your experience there? Do you sometimes worry, okay, if you say no this time, they might not ask you back or you have to cancel and have conflict. How does that feel for you? Yeah. And that's such a difficult question because everybody approaches it very differently. And I have some colleagues who will just, if the right opportunity comes up, for instance, they'll cancel everything else and they'll open up for it. I feel very strongly that if I've committed to something, that I will do it. So I've had cases where I'm working with a really small organization, I've committed to them. And then one of the biggest opera houses in the world asked me to come and conduct something. And I've said no, because I've committed to something else. And that's just a matter of, I don't want to let that smaller organization down. And in particular, the big house will find someone else to do it, but the small house will <laughs> not. And that's really hard. It's, I, I would say that's the hardest thing. Usually I have not said no to opportunities because I feel like there are some people I know, for instance, who won't take assistant conducting gigs or won't take education concerts and won't take certain gigs where, well, I'm a woman, so I got asked to do this because it's all women composers, so I'm going to refuse it, those kinds of things. So I, and I understand all the reasons for doing that. There are people who will, for instance, say, I don't want to take any education concerts because I'm afraid I'll get pigeonholed into education concerts or I won't take assistant gigs because I don't want to just get stuck as an assistant conductor. I have never turned down things for that reason. If the project interests me, I will be an assistant to it, or I will do the education project, or I will do whatever. And often in my experience, some of those have turned into better and better opportunities. I mostly look at, is this repertoire that interests me? Are these people I want to work with on this repertoire? But there are other people who approach it very differently than I do. I think in some ways, my choice to just just focus on, is it the right project rather than is this a kind of high level glitzy opportunity has slowed down my path in a way. But I think that's ultimately been a good thing for me because it's given me opportunities to learn and grow in my craft. I also have had the opportunity of turning down an A house, for instance, because I was already committed to something else. And that was maybe four years ago. They haven't asked me back, but that doesn't mean they won't. But I'd rather do that than destroy a relationship with maybe someone who runs a smaller organization, but who's been really supportive of my career for a long time and who continues to be a colleague and a friend. And I turned down another kind of a house opportunity recently that we'll see if they'll ask me back again or if that'll be that. But that's a hard thing. And especially when you're starting out or when you're as a conductor, just still figuring out which opportunities to grab, the best ones often come up at the last moment. And that's really hard because when the best things come up at the last moment, it's always because somebody canceled or something opened up or something changed. How do you balance that? And do you keep your schedule open so that you're there for in case something comes up? Well, that can be dangerous too. Or do you turn down or get yourself, extricate yourself from things you're already committed to? Well, then you're breaking trust with other relationships and it's really hard and I don't have the answer to it. I know, totally. I recently got asked to do some of the last minute jump in and thing and of course, from a bigger organization, you're just one of the conductors to them. They have a lot of other people on their list. But at the same time, I was worried and concerned. Am I capable of learning the rep the best I can in such a short amount of time and do some work that is representative to my ability and to my professionalism? And I know this is like, it's such a hard <laughs> situation to navigate. Did you decide that you wanted a career that spans between almost half and half between symphonic and opera houses, or it just happened that that's where things that you got asked to do. You know, it, it just happened. And I'm very <laughs> lucky that it just happened. It's unusual for it to happen. Actually, it's very hard because the two worlds are so separate from each other. But as it started to happen early on in my career, I ended up kind of doing both half and half. And then I ended up starting to do more and more opera. And that had more to do with just where I had connections and where my management had connections and kind of the way my path ended up going. And at that, that it's only at that point that I realized, oh, I'm working at a higher, higher level in opera. And I'm not doing the same 
kind of symphonic world. And I'd love to maintain that balance. So I ended up kind of readjusting some of what I did. And now I've continued to have that balance, which is very lucky and very good because the two complement each other and they offer very different challenges. And from like a life and a music making standpoint, it's really nice to be able to do both at different times. Yeah. And then as you say that when you have, now, now you say that it's like, I thought it must be a luxury for you to do just a symphonic concert because you have four, as you say, like four rehearsals for maybe just 75 minutes of work. That's pretty much just one act. Of an oh yeah. It's great. No, it feels so easy. And not only that, but you don't have to worry about some set piece, not moving on time and you're having to adjust everything as a result or, or some singer being sick and you're having to rethink how you do everything to make it possible for them to sing. So yeah, in that way it's, it's much easier, but there are again, pros and cons. On the other hand, with symphonic rap, you just have to have this intense specificity and you have to make sure that you have this that you find that you get the orchestra on board with your interpretation right away because with opera everyone is there working together to create this one bigger thing and so opera orchestras really i think understand that they're there not just to make the music and the, for the so support the conductor also through this one concert but it's to make the entire machine of it work to support the singers on the stage all of the things that come together in a symphony concert, you have to get that orchestra to be on board with you and what you're doing for that concert, because there's nothing else to focus on except for the music making and that symphonic music in the moment. So it sounds like the mentality is very different between the different kinds of gigs. And when I was a student, I had a teacher who told me the orchestra in the opera pit actually needs you much more because they are on the rehearse and there are so much things that going on. They can hear the singers. They don't know what's going on. They really need you there as opposed to the symphonic orchestra. They usually know the rap better than you do. <laughs> but do you feel the same way? And do you have, do you feel that it's a different dynamic when you go into rehearsal and having to take them with you and kind of trust you with your interpretations? Yeah. And one thing I love about especially good opera orchestras is that they're so responsive. You can do so much in the moment. I've had to skip entire sections of music in the moment sometimes even to make things worse. I mean, that work. I mean, that's, that's an extreme case, but in terms of also interpretively, you can change your interpretation from performance to performance and they'll follow you. you. It's all through gesture and you can just show that and it'll happen. Symphonic orchestras, there are some orchestras that are like that, but not all orchestras. And the problem is unless every player in the orchestra is right there with you, right, it becomes harder. So if half or three quarters of the orchestra is really responsive, but not all. So I think you have to find ways right away from the first rehearsal to establish with a symphonic orchestra that you're going to make things clear to them through gesture right away so that they jump on board. And there's this moment of keeping things really consistent because you can, unlike in opera where things are inconsistent because of the nature of the piece, keeping things very consistent, but also keeping it just fresh enough and not over rehearsing so that the orchestra again goes with you and doesn't just get into the habit of doing something the same way every single time. And as you mentioned, it's also, yes, it's made more complicated when the orchestra has played certain rep a lot and has a particular way that they play their rep, especially if you have a slightly different vision for it. So do you feel that the opera conducting requires better technique or different techniques than, as you say, you have to sometimes change even or sometimes with a different cast or the singer is feeling differently. They sing totally differently from the night before and you have to change and be understood right away. You feel that's the, it's a different craft. So they're just very, it's, it's hard to say. I would say that in opera, you have to be much more clear exactly what you want in the moment. But in opera, you can sometimes get away without being clear when it comes to like being super nuanced in your conducting because there's the bigger picture and sometimes people might not notice some of the nuance and there's a pit kind of hiding some of the things. In a symphonic context, all of the nuances have to be crystal clear in a different way. But in symphony, you can get away with rehearsing some of that into the 
orchestra before you kind of get to the performance level. It won't sound as fresh, but you can get away with that. And you can also get away in a symphonic context with being totally unclear and terrible and the orchestra still sounding good because they don't have, again, there aren't other things. So in symphonic conducting, you can get away with a lot. I think if you have reached the highest heights, you can reach even more because it's just that music on itself that you're focusing on. And it's just those nuances that come across beautifully. So there's a higher reach to go to, but also you can get away with a lot because especially with standard repertoire, as you mentioned, often the orchestras will know it really well, get away with playing a lot of it without the conductor if they need to. Some of it is not getting in the orchestra's way, frankly, with some things. While with an opera, that's not possible. There's too much to coordinate. So what's the biggest challenge you find in either or some shared challenge or something that's so important that you've learned along along your journey navigating both worlds? As you say, in, especially in the United States, it's so separated. I heard in Europe, it's more combined. But here, because I think mostly because of scheduling and all that, it feels like two totally different worlds at times. Yeah, they're so different. It's also because in Europe, I think often the same orchestra in a given city will play for the opera, for the ballet and the symphony. And here they're totally different organizations, which is a shame because I think it makes players also less flexible. The best musicians I, I find and the best orchestra performers are the ones who play all of those different kinds of styles and all of those different genres. But the biggest challenges, I mean, there's so many, but I would say figuring out right away because the orchestra time is very limited in this country. In Europe, you get a lot more rehearsal time. In the U.S., whether in opera or orchestral context, you get very little time. So I think a lot of it is the biggest challenge is figuring out what does this particular orchestra need, especially if it's a group you haven't worked with before, because every group is going to be different, both in terms of just psychological and group dynamics, but also in terms of what they grasp quickly and naturally, what needs rehearsal time, what doesn't, what just fixes itself over time. And and a lot of that comes from the culture of the group, from the combination of players you have there. So I would say that is the hardest thing that I'm always trying to evolve and figure out in any ensemble I come to. And it's always much easier if I go to a group I've worked with a bunch of times before because then they know what to expect from me. I know what to expect from them. I know exactly what will happen naturally for them and what I have to spend time on. But if it's a brand new group, then that's the biggest part of the challenge. That's always so hard. Is You can only prepare so much on your end, but then there's so much for me. It's always very nervous. And I was like, I, I don't know how to go into the first rehearsal. And you're a judge from the way you walk into the room. Do you do anything to kind of prepare yourself musically or mentally when you go in? Even with a new house, you go in first rehearsal with just singers and I kind of getting the sound from them. How do you prepare for that? Yeah, well, I think the most important thing is to remember that it's not about you because as soon as you start worrying about how people perceive you or how you'll come across or all of these kinds of surface things, as soon as you start worrying about that, and we all worry about those things, I think, but, but as soon as that becomes the focus, it will become counterproductive. Because ultimately, I think it's remembering that we go in there to listen and to shape the sound that we hear, that our job is to shape sound and to shape it in in whatever way. So I think the most important thing for me is always to remind myself First of all, that I want to be there and that this is really exciting and it's really fun. It's awesome what we get to do. We get to just stand there and like wave a stick and amazing music happens. Then sometimes it's easy to forget that when we're worrying about all of the other things and did I study my score enough or how am I going to conduct this or is that going to be clear or that person, that that wind player is behind and is it my fault or is it them? Or how do I make it work, right? It's really easy to get stuck on all all those other things. But I think the most important thing is to remember that we do this because we love it and because the music making is exciting and hopefully that's the case for everyone else in the group too and to listen and to shape and that's that's all we can offer really and and hope that whatever shaping that we do that other people will jump on board with because and there are so many different ways to approach any piece of music. That is wonderful. And thank you so much for all that you have shared. I'll put this in the show notes, but I wanted my listeners to hear it from you. If they wanted to know more about you, is there 
a website, social media handle that you want to share with us? Yes. So my social media, all of the handles are the same. It's at Lydia Conductor and Lydia is spelled L-I-D-I-Y-A. So at L-I-D-I-Y-A Conductor or my website is www.lydiaconductor.com and you can sign up for my mailing list there as well. Thank you so much again for coming here. Thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Here you go, my friends, and I hope you loved this conversation. And I absolutely enjoyed every minute speaking with Lydia, especially when she had opened up and be so genuine with all the answers and sharing her experiences working in rehearsal, preparing for her works both in opera houses and in symphonic concert settings. And I just wanted to say, if you missed it, episode number 32 was my conversation with stage director Stephanie Havey. And she had a lot of great things to share as well from the other perspective of working in an opera production. And I thought some of the things that Stephanie shared would really compromise or complement what Lydia had shared today. I'll put that in the show notes if you have missed that. And it was also a wonderful, great conversation with Stephanie. My biggest takeaway from today's conversation with Lydia was what she said about us as conductors going into rehearsals and to the podium to listen and to shape the music. Nothing else is really important at that point. I am certainly guilty of thinking and worrying about other things such as, oh, was I clear? Oh, that transition was bad. I got too fast, too soon. Oh, this principle, something is not up to their game. Or, oh, maybe this orchestra just hates me. They are not responding to anything that I showed. Was I not clear? Or do they just ignore me? And nothing like this is really important, even though it's, I know it's so hard. I'm also guilty, as I said. But of course, it comes better with experience and also with a strong mindset of being confident and comfortable in my own skin and coming and facilitate everything. And I will also encourage you to listen to episode number 34, my conversation with town conductor Tiani Lu, when she talks about how the different mindset that she comes into the podium now changed the way she works with musicians. That was also a wonderful and life-changing conversation for me. And... I am so thankful for you listening and for all my friends who come and give interviews for this Conductors podcast. Thank you. I can't do anything without (laughs) any of you. And I will see you again next week at the same time, same place. Bye for now. 